Good afternoon. My name is Steve Lewis, and I am with Rocky Mountain Bible College and Seminary. Uh, I've had the privilege of being there almost 11 years now. I have been a part of GES for a few years. I've uh, done a few things here, and I've been blessed to know some of you, and I get to know some of you more, maybe a little bit more. Uh, what I want to share this, uh, this afternoon is something that I, I helped put together years, a few years ago, but at the same time, this last fall, I was asked by the Awana groups to do Awana conferences for uh, Denver area, for uh, Colorado Springs, for uh, Grand Junction, and for Salt Lake City. Uh, I was a key speaker on the gospel because it's really a passion of mine for us to keep it simple. Uh, as I always begin, I think it's always important that we look at this. But before we do, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for an opportunity to be here, uh, for your marvelous, matchless grace and who you are, what you have accomplished, and what we are yet to understand even more as we diligent, diligently seek you through your word by the power of the Spirit that we might be better displayers of your grace in all that we do and say. We thank you for all those that are here, that they may learn, that we all learn from one another. At the same time, Lord, we learn how to live graciously and in love with people that we may not like and they may not understand us, and yet we will be that as a matter of grace. We just thank you today in Christ's name. Amen. The golden rule of interpretation has always been, and you all probably know this, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. It's a real simple way to approach Scripture. I think too often, most people we know, probably not us necessarily, most people are kind of afraid to get into it. Uh, my last pastor back in the 90s, a young lady came up to me, uh, and she says, Pastor, you're, I don't mind what you preach, but just promise me, promise me you'll never preach from Revelation. I said, well... You know, you, you, you kind of lucked out on that. I, I finished out a couple years ago, and I'm not scheduled for probably maybe, you know, another 10 years, maybe. And uh, she says, but it, I, I just don't want to ever read that. And she says, it's just too scary, and it's to all these symbols and all these other things. And I said, well, you know, the odd thing about that is the book of Revelation is one of those books that says there's a promise in reading it and, you know, being participating in it. And you'd be surprised on how much is clearly understandable by the author's intention if you just read it. But she just said, no, no, I, I don't want to do that. So uh, she lucked out. Seven or eight years later, I moved on and didn't get back to it. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's Lucy. Boy, look at the rain. What if it floods the whole world? It will never do that, line. It says, in the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that it would never happen again. The sign of the promise is the rainbow. And, of course, Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. To which Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. You know, it, it never gets old to understand that, that we can always rest assured that God's Word's going to give us what He desired for us to know. Now, the hard part about the Word of God, it doesn't tell us everything we want to know. Oh, if it just told me this or told me that. And I've always been surprised at people that would say, you know, if God would only tell me more, I would bet that person that asked the question has never really understood what's already there. You know, so I, I, people have asked me, what translation do you like to use? I said, well, I can tell you what I use, but I will tell you this. When, I'll tell you what I prefer when you wear out the one you have. It's not a matter of the translation. It's probably that you're just not reading it. So when you wear it out, come and call me, and I'll give you something else to read with it. Another translation. So, though we have preferences and we can go on all of that, and Dr. Nyamalai, uh, we do all of those things where we are. One of the things I enjoy doing about the gospel is I tell people there's three things you really need to remember about sharing the message of grace. The gospel message is this. The first one is it's always about him, who he is, what he's done, and not about us. If anybody shares something that somehow involves you doing something, it's probably not the message that gives life. It's some other message to sort of either control or to sort of get you into their way of thinking, and it's not really biblical. It's always about him, not about us. The second thing is, it always needs to be simple enough for a child to understand. You know, my daughter is no scholar. She would, ask, she would tell people, she says, I, I, I've never been to Bible college. Uh, she has some learning differences along in her life. But she's just a wonderful young lady who really loves the Lord. And for her, it's just simple to say, uh, 
That's what the Bible says, John 3.16. And she just quotes it to them. And then they go on. She says, well, what is it you don't understand about that simple verse? In its context. So, first of all, it's always about him, not about us. Second, it must be simple enough for a child to understand it. Now, when I hear people say, you've got to read all these things and know all these things, I'm quite surprised. Because most people don't know all those things, nor do they do them. And generally speaking, people add those things so that they look better than others. And I don't think that's what God intends in the message of life. God intends for us to understand it simply enough. Einstein said one time, if you can't say it simply, you really don't understand it. And I think he's true when it comes to the gospel, the message of life. We find too often that we complicate the issue when it's very simple. And third, which we're going to talk about today, it, it is, can, must be consistent from Genesis to Revelation. If you really study the passages and study the scriptures, you know, I'm sure everybody read from Genesis to Revelation before class today. <laughs> Even the cliff notes are long, just got to tell you. But the idea being that God's plan, God's message has never changed. It has always been by grace through faith. He's, but again, I grew up with a, with a urban myth that somehow keeping the law was how people of the Old Testament were saved, and we're under grace now. It's always been by grace through faith. And it's always been based upon Jesus' death and resurrection. That's the only offer that's ever been made that's going to give everlasting life. Now, it, before time, it looked forward to it, but ultimately, in the plan of God, the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection is the foundation of which the offer is ever made. So it has to be consistent from Genesis to Revelation. One of the things I want to look at, I'm going to explain it verbally, that when I finish this, I will go through a small chart that I think will help us visualize what we've just been talking about. Okay, So be a little bit patient, there's a few words here. I'm not sure in the beginning what to call the kind of life that Adam and Eve possessed at the, or in the original creation. I don't. Most people use the word innocence. You know, but what does that mean? What, what could they lose if they disobeyed that they didn't have, etc.? So what we said, uh, a few of us, uh, Bob Wilkin and John Niemel and I have been discussing this, but, the, but Adam and Eve did lack everlasting life after the fall. We know that because they needed it. They lacked it before the fall too, but the difference is that before the fall, they did not need it. I tell you, I'm still working through this. So if you're looking perplexed, I'm twice as perplexed. But I think it's worth doing. When Adam and Eve ate from the truth of the forbidden tree in the garden, God did not declare them sinners, although they were and we are. God declared them dead. Right? Didn't he say, the day you eat of it, you shall die and you will die, is the way the Hebrew is. He tells us, so the result of it, every human being is estranged from God, alienated from the life of God, according to Ephesians 4.18. Now, it appears that Adam and Eve started out dying physically the moment they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's possible that they did not die spiritually then. If they did, it means that they had everlasting life before the fall, and then they kind of lost it, and that doesn't seem to fit. If it's everlasting, it's like, hence the word, as Jeremy said so well today, it's eternal life. I, when, I, when I share uh, assurance of salvation, I just use the phrase, what is it about everlasting life you do just not understand? It's inherent in the term. Dr. Ryrie used to say, if it's not eternal, then somehow we have misnamed it. You know, it's not probation, it's not good luck, as Calvin would say. Anyway, before the fall, Adam and Eve were not sinners, but they didn't need everlasting life. But if they had sinned, they never would have had everlasting life, nor would they have ever died. Once they sinned, they put themselves in a predicament. Now they were going to die physically. If they died physically without everlasting life, they would spend an eternity apart from God. That seems to be what we're looking at here, that I'd never really studied much until most recently. And uh, so now they needed everlasting life. It's not that they died spiritually when they disobeyed. It's that they became sinners when they sinned. Before they sinned, they met the condition of sinlessness. After they disobeyed, they did not. 
Therefore, what man has needed since that time is not only their sins forgiven. And think about someone who is shot and it kills them and they remove the bullet afterwards. The means by which they died has been removed, but what is still wrong with them? (laughs) X's across their eyes. They're gone. But they still, they remove that cause of the death, but they still need life. Life, uh, the more importantly, they needed everlasting life. At the great white throne, the lost are judged and cast in the lake of fire. And why? what are they judged on? What are they judged on at the, at John, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15? What's the reason they're cast in the lake of fire? The names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. It doesn't say, no, it does talk about works and other things, but that's not the reason they're there. The reason they're there is because they don't possess life. So the real issue that we have to deal with people is the idea of life and death. If we get into comparisons of one to another, well, someone says, well, I'm better than you are, and I'm going, that doesn't take much. You've really set your standard low. (laughs) But at the same time, are everyone without Christ as bad off as they'll ever be? Absolutely. They call it dead. So the Lamb's Book of Life is necessary. Now, unbelief is the cause for the unsaved not having an everlasting life. Not having an everlasting life is the reason they're condemned into the lake of fire. That's a good distinction to keep because we, we mix it up so often. We want to zero in on their sins. Now, I have many people that say, well, you know, point out how sinful they are. That's sort of a no-brainer. But for me, when you begin to point that out, you begin to build a barrier. But the one thing that almost everybody can understand, and trust me, a child can understand something about death. And it'll be gruesome about it. It's the idea that death occurs. I bet all of us remember the first time we heard or understood a little bit about death. It may have been scary. It may have been something else. I I must have been maybe third grade, and I was sitting in a church, and for some reason they sat all those little kids in the front seat. You know, the more I stared at that poor woman, I thought she moved about four or five times. You know, because I'm just just staring like, what's happening here? Kind of an odd thing. At the cross, the righteous justice of God was satisfied for all humanity. Wouldn't we agree on that? If we happen to somehow say, well, it only becomes true when it's true for you. Uh, that didn't work for existentialism or uh, other types of philosophies. But somehow we kind of apply that when we look at everlasting life. Or about the death of Christ. You know, there's a, there's a saying out there that says, it is sufficient for all, but efficient for only those. Reform will say the elect. Lewis Barry Chafer said, for all those that believe. So it's only effective, but but it's all sufficient. The odd thing about it is the Bible doesn't make that distinction. It says Christ died for, oh, you know, 1 John, what does it say? Not only for us, but for the, so, you know, it's either you can't say, well, I'm not really part of the whole world, so it's special for me. It doesn't work that way. So propitiation is what Jesus Christ did for the whole world, and I give you the passages. Therefore, it is by grace alone, through faith alone, and believe, faith, trust is the same Greek word in the New Testament. When people make a distinction, it's not enough to believe, you have to trust. you got to say it that way. Trust. And you go, oh, wow, yeah, I have to work on that one. It's the same word. But most people in our circles wouldn't, don't know that because we've seen it said over and over with different groups, you know, all of these things. And we're here. What I want to do is show the consistency of the Word of God and what it says. And we believe in Him alone uh, based on His death and resurrection. We receive the free gift of everlasting life, which is the remedy for everlasting death. Therefore, when a person comes to God through believing in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, in his role as mediator, bestows everlasting life on the believer, thus introducing him or her to God. God, in response, accepts the believing person and pronounces him or her justified. Seems to be the way 
Paul's way of looking at it in relation to the way John declares it. They're never in contradiction. But one is speaking about all the things that go on. One of the great uh, things to remember, I, I do a, a series on the security of the believer. And one of those things is the nature of the believer. And Lewis Berry Chafer listed 33 items that, that occur to a believer the moment they believe. Now, most of us were probably not aware of all of those things happening. You know, it was number 12, 13, 14. Ooh, 17 was, wow, that was nice. You know, we aren't aware of those things. And yet, Bible declares that. So he tells us there that we are justified. Now, I want to take you through a small chart that I'll take you through. And we can kind of walk you through, if you will. The message gives life from Genesis to Revelation. If I were to ask you, what are the three things that a person needs to remember when they share their faith or share the message of life, the gospel, what are those three things? The first one is? Oh, boy, this is going to be a long day. Okay. It's always about him, not about us. Second one is? Simple enough for a child to understand it. Third, it is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. That last one is going to help clarify so many things that people will say, well, I, I know we need this, but you didn't have that there. You didn't have all these other things. It's amazing. It's always been by grace through faith, always based upon the finished work, death, resurrection, burial, if you will. All those things true, fully deity, fully humanity, virgin born, and we can go through all the lists there. Because who he is, we can have everlasting life. Isn't that something? If we believe in him. So I want to show it sort of a visual way. And I had my email up there, so if you want a copy of this, please, send, I didn't print this out. Uh, but you'll be welcome, I'll send you a copy of it, there's no problem at all. And my email is drs lewis drs lewis at rmbc.edu. Our uh, drs dr s lewis l e w i s at rmbc.edu. Drs lewis at rmbc.edu. So, let me show you this visually, and I think it's, it's a neat thing to do to be able to look at this. Think of this line representing eternity. I know you thought it was bigger, wouldn't you? <laughs> thought it would be fatter or more spectacular, but, you know, we'll just let that represent you. No, no beginning, no end in the way God is. And remember, only God is eternal. We will never be eternal. I had a beginning, at least my mother said so. I take her word for that. She never lied to me before. So the idea is that we have a beginning. So the most we can ever have is something that begins and lasts forever. When people say, you, you become eternal, be careful. And now, again, some people without thinking use the term because it's sort of the vernacular of our day. But what we have is everlasting and it will never end. It will never separate us from God and all these other things. So why would say, from the very beginning, the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. Isn't that interesting? We find that in the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 2, and Revelation, verses 13, verse 8. The way God sees it, His perspective is, from an eternal perspective, the Lamb of God was slain before the world ever began. How many times have someone said the death of Jesus Christ is sort of a, a plan B after plan A really failed? That God says, oh, by the way, oh, boy, what am I going to do? Okay, you, to the cross. Yeah, you, yeah, you, to the cross. Didn't say that. From what I understand of Scripture, it seems to indicate that this is God's plan. Now, here's, here's the real trick to this. He doesn't tell us how his plans work doesn't tell us all his plans. He didn't tell us in what order he designed all these things to take place. 
when people say they know the order of the decrees, you're, you're asking a question of something the Bible doesn't give us. So I've had many of people say, but this is the secret will of God. My first thought is, my goodness, a guy couldn't even keep a secret. And he's supposed to keep me secure for, for, for eternity future? I'm putting my trust in him and any blabs, which is his normal secrets. Generally, what they're trying to say is they know something you don't know. And the problem is, is it may not be biblical. A lot of people know things that are not biblical. It doesn't make it right. So we find here the way God views it, the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. Now, I don't know how that, how that works. I don't know how that is. That seems to be, when I look at it, the passages tell me these things. Yes? Is the defeat of Satan equally uh, before the foundation of the world? I mean, you see, uh, you know, the defeat of Satan, you know, I, I, I don't know how that works. Uh, you mean the fall of Satan? Or the defeat. Defeat, Satan is defeated at the death. Uh, death, death and Satan are those enemies that are finally defeated at the cross. Now, the, if I, if the angelic warfare thing, I have to tell you, it's sort of a, I don't really get some of that. You know, and I have friends that are writing on some of those things most recently, uh, as such. And that's why some people put a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 to fit in the thing so they're, Either their evolution will fit, <laughs> or somehow they have an explanation of some kind of warfare. I don't really know. It's you know, above my pay grade. Okay. Yeah, good question. So it, it, when we, God created life, and I, I, we discussed a little bit on what that life might be. But because they disobeyed, God called them dead. And what they have needed since, and we call that sin, because it was disobedience. What it resulted in that was death. And again, what happened is that because of that, every person is estranged from the life of God. What Jesus came to do was to reconcile us back to the Father through, Jesus, through himself as such. This is the kind of death it talks about. And then I, what I tell people is go to the other end and find out what the end result of this is. The great white throne judgment. See, and now... This doesn't, this kind of alleviates all the things about, is it Gehenna? You know, is it just the grave? Is it, you know, all of these things? I don't care where you are on any of those issues. We cannot escape the very fact that in Revelation chapter 20 verse 15, we have people who are cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever that because their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. So it seems to tell us at the very end, ultimately, no matter what you want to do in between now and then, the last judgment for the lost are going to be on the basis of not having life. And we can go back to the beginning in Genesis when they disobeyed and said, this is where that dead part started, and this is how he ultimately is going to complete all these things. So we go through here, and now we know this need, which is life. Now, the way in which it seems to unfold in Scripture, and this is just a small synopsis of it, Genesis 3.15 begins with that great promise of how God is going to accomplish this overcoming death kind of thing, and that is going to be through the seed of the woman. And that seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent, even though the seed of the serpent may bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. Now, I, I can't, you know, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes there going, you know, what? What do you mean seed? What does that mean? Well, if you go to the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, you will find out that they understood that, and probably rightly so, that our firstborn, what does she call the firstborn? What do they call, name the firstborn? You can talk, I'm sorry. To say. Cain. Why do they call him Cain? Joe was taken, Pete was taken. No, I've acquired a man, the Lord. She thought, and they thought, this is the answer. Well, how did that work? Okay, it wasn't him. 
So they have another son. You know, they have, they have uh, Abel, and then they have Seth. And what you find from then on in is a, as was brought out really well yesterday, of how God is choosing this lineage of this promised seed of which the deliverer will come who will ultimately bless the whole world. And then in chapter 12 of Genesis, we begin to see a little bit more information about it. That The first, first uh, delimiting is taking everyone else out of the picture, no sense, and it's through Abraham's seed. Why does God choose Abram? Why does God choose Abram? You're right. God only knows. Yeah, that's it. He, we don't know why. And that's the kind of question we ask all the way through, if we're really honest. When we see it, okay, Abram has two sons. One, he tries to help God out. Didn't work well. But you see, did Ishmael have a, did he have a right to be a descendant of Abraham? He was truly a descendant. But why did God choose Isaac? God only knows. Isaac has two sons. Two. Which one was the better son? Which one's which one you ask? Mom says, that's my boy. That's my boy. Jacob and Dad, are you kidding? That guy couldn't find a rabbit if it fell on him. He couldn't hunt if his life depended on it. Jacob was what we call a mama's boy. And dad was dysfunctional. I mean, you, yeah, we could follow this dysfunction. That's a whole other series. But this idea is, is that God is in the process of, of delimiting and bringing through this promise. Now, he gets to Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons. Now, which is the ones that Jacob loves? Joseph and Benjamin. Now, we can say, now everybody says, okay, now I can see where you're going, God. It's Joseph, man. You put him through the ringer for this one. He's got to be the one prepared. Boy, it's going to look like what Jesus is going to do. Who does he choose? Now, Judah was one of those that didn't participate in any of this, right? He stood by going, oh, bros, don't go, don't do this, don't do this. I beg you. <laughs> you was probably the one going, hey, I need more money for this guy. He is strong. <laughs> That's the kind of thing. Now, he, now through, through, he brings us through Judah, and we, and we just follow this all the way through. And that's the way God has it. And then we get over to the prophets, and we read Isaiah 9. And you read Isaiah 9, and you go, now that's, that's the Savior. Mighty God. All these great terms there. And we're going through the, I like this, I like this. And he's, that's a conquering hero. And you get to Isaiah 53, it's the term oive. He's going to die. These are all showing us the way God is ultimately bringing about the deliverer that would fulfill the great promise as the seed of the woman that would bring life. Why? Because we are under the penalty of death. Death is not a wrath. Death is a penalty for God's justice. He didn't say the day you eat of it, I'm going to be so angry, I'm just going to limp, rip you limb from limb. Not the limb you took the fruit from, but the other limbs. He doesn't say that. He says, you're dying, you will die. So it goes through there. So, what they, so we get all these things as we go along. And you know the most interesting thing? A friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, likes to give out the Gospel of John. I hope you all learn to do the same thing. If you look at the prologue of John, you will find in some sort of fashion there almost a synopsis of all that transpired before in the prologue. If you think about it from the very beginning there, he's, he doesn't tell us his name. When do we finally know the name of this deliverer of the Old Testament? We know he's Emmanuel. We know what he's like. We know he's the King of Kings. We know he's the Lord of Lords. We know he's he's Almighty, you know, Almighty God. All these things we don't know his name till later. The prologue of John says the same thing. He's the Word, God, Creator, Life, Light. Then he injects this, not John the Baptist, just in case you're wondering. 
And then he says, and he you know created does all these things. It doesn't tell you get all the way through to what verse? Seventeen. The grace and through truth comes through Jesus Christ. That's that's designed to draw the reader. I think the Old Testament is the same thing, designed to trust God that He's going to reveal His name, but He tells us all that He's going to accomplish there from the very beginning of Genesis chapter three. He goes through. So we need that. We need everlasting life. Finally, we have at the cross the righteous justice of God is satisfied for all humanity. The crucifixion, his death and resurrection is what accomplished what God said would happen. And isn't it amazing at the cross, doesn't it appear to all those that are watching that somehow Satan has won? It's like, okay, this is it. This is, now this is the best you got, God. You know, you send this guy and, and I, I can take him out just like that. Just like that. But from God's side, what is happening? Jesus Christ willingly lays down his life. No one took it from him. He's the one who came as that substitute, as the one who died in our place. And he is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. I can't escape that. If you want to say it's the world of the elect or it's the, the world of this or that, it doesn't seem, that kind of language doesn't seem consistent to the way John uses world all the way through. So we now know his name is Jesus Christ, that promised one who came and fulfilled all those things. You know, time doesn't give us uh, enough to get to all the different foreshadowing of who this seed promise is. But you can follow it through. But like I said, even in your understanding of the Gospel of John, you can see that in a sort of a short way in the prologue, in those first 16 verses that God is telling the reader, I want you to begin asking the question, who is this guy? Who's the word? What do you mean word? What does that mean? You know, all the way through, and then you get to his name, Jesus Christ. So when Old Testament people believed, did they believe in the name of Jesus Christ? No, they didn't know the name. So it's like, well, now, now if you talk to some reform, oh yeah, everyone knew his name. They knew who it was and they believed in him. It doesn't seem to be consistent. You've got to take the text and inject something into it. I was talking, I was reading, a, uh, there's a book by R.C. Sproul. I don't necessarily recommend him, but anyway. But I will say this. He said, Roman Catholics take the Old Testament and insert it into the New. And so you get priests, sacrifices, I don't have to get the nuns, but that's a whole other issue. They get all of this in there. And he says, reform, take the New Testament, insert it into the Old. But what God intended all along is that this progress of revelation was always to be building upon it to ultimately we know the name of the one who would deliver us from death. And they believed God for that promise of the one that would get life. So why would God say, you know, all along you believe the promise of everlasting life through the deliverer, now we know the name, and he comes along now and says, I don't want you to believe in the promise of everlasting life through through this one we now know as Jesus Christ, but I want you to now place your faith in the work that he did of his death and resurrection. I, I I don't understand that. I'm not saying there aren't people that do that. I'm just saying, I can't seem to find that consistent. It's like, well, that's a different dispensation. And I am a dispensationalist. I know, don't hate me, don't hate me, no. But, but I, I, it's the only word I know how to use, to use for that kind of thing. God has been consistent all the way through. He's never changed the method of salvation. The method of, method of receiving everlasting life it has always been by grace through faith. And I think we do an injustice by trying to make it something else because just because now we know the one who was the promised one and the one who had already promised us by God's promise that he would give us everlasting life. In fact, for me, this is my own preference, we use the word gospel to talk about good news. I think it's better understood as good message because news almost connotates what part of that word seems to give other meanings. It's something new, something new. It's not. It's the good message. It's the message that was proclaimed at the beginning. It is still the same message. All we know now is the name of the one who promised these things. 
Therefore, Christ is Jesus Christ, the propitiation of sins for the whole world. I'll give you the passages there. And I gave those things that we've already talked about. Jesus is, you know, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, chapter, John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, as the only one who can give the free gift of everlasting life to those who believe, faith, trust their faith in Him alone. This can only be a legitimate offer if He is Lord God. No other kind of Savior can save except the God-man. You know, people say, well, it depends on what Jesus you believe in. What do you mean what Jesus you believe in? The Jesus of Scripture describes who He is all the way through. But ultimately, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The perfect statement of John says what? So that you, the reader, the unbeliever, might do what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you have life in His name. That's the purpose. So if the purpose is for believers to get to believe... It's like, wow, that's interesting. doesn't seem to be there. In other words, uh, he must be God in order that the death he effectively is effective for an infinite number of persons. Therefore, it has to be who Jesus Christ is. I hope this is sort of an introduction. Many of you have probably heard of this before in some way. But I do think it's important that we clearly keep these things in front of our thinking that when we share the message that we that we never confuse the idea of it's always about him and not about us and there's a lot of us stuff out there is there anything we could promise that would be sufficient for him to go well that's good enough i just can't imagine what it would be even if, if i said i will promise to really really be good and he would say it hasn't worked so far Steve, you really suck at that. You know, I know you know me, right? But okay. So that's where I'm at with it. Uh, I want to open it up for questions, um, if that'll help in any way. If not, uh, anyway, please. We have 20 minutes. I have 20 minutes. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, okay. Let me let me start something else. No, just kidding. <laughs> What do you think? Yes. You said earlier, when you were describing death, you said it was a penalty for God's... What you said. Justice. His justice. Wrath, and I like what Rene did many, oh, maybe what, eight, nine years ago? He did an article on uh, the occurrence of the word wrath, and he concluded, and I think I've checked it out somewhat, and I would say that his conclusion was wrath always occurs within time not in eternity. Now, that includes the tribulation because that's still in time. The millennial kingdom is still within time. Eternity, which we call after the millennial kingdom, when Jesus takes the keys of his kingdom, gives them to the Father to be the kingdom over all, that's still a matter of what I call eternity future. So I would say that's how I would evaluate that. Yeah, good question. What else? Yes. Huh? Huh? No, anyone but you. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, some people make the distinction that someone who was already a believer in the coming Messiah had to specifically put faith oh, in Jesus by name once that name was proclaimed. I'd be curious as to how you view that as did God somehow guarantee that everyone who was already a believer would recognize Jesus by name as the Messiah or, hey, they were already saved, they already had eternal life whether they ever did or not. Yeah. It would seem, the question was, does a person who is saved before they know the name of who Jesus Christ is have to be sort of confirmed again once they hear the name as such? It does, Bible doesn't seem to indicate that, for as far as I can tell. I think as far as being included into the, into the body of what we call the body of Christ, the church, there's, there's, a little, there's something there that has to take place. But as far as being a, being a saved person, it almost sounds as if, you know, I'm saved and saved and saved, and I see who Jesus is, but I don't quite know who he is. So from that moment, I see who he is and don't believe. Now I'm now lost until I now put my faith in that name of that person. That doesn't seem to be consistent with the scriptures. John? I would think that uh, the way that that view would have arisen would probably be from this understanding yeah. of Acts 19. Yeah, good. Go ahead. Uh, 
in Acts 19, Paul played 20 questions with, the, with his questioners. He recognized that they had an old message. So he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Well, no, they hadn't. Uh, that wouldn't have been until Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. That's the point where that started to happen. But their answer was one that effectively was, well, we not only believe before Acts 10, but we also believe before Acts 2. Uh, because what they said, uh, when Paul asked if they had received the Holy Spirit when they believed, they said, we have not even uh, heard that there is the Holy Spirit. Not in the sense of saying, we didn't know that the Holy Spirit existed. And let me illustrate why that's not the case. Let's say that I told the Apostle Paul, I came to Ephesus in a jet. He would not say to me, I have not even heard if there is a jet. He'd say, what's a jet? What they were saying was, we hadn't even heard that the Holy Spirit that John the Baptist had announced had yet come. How did we miss it? Yeah. So then Paul said, well, since you're before Acts 10 and before Acts 2, I want to find out if you're before Acts or before Luke uh, 3.16. So what Paul said then was, into what then were you baptized? Their answer was, into John's baptism. So they were saying they didn't know that Jesus had come, and therefore they were not included within uh, a message that had that further clarification. But ultimately, what Paul does for them allows them to enjoy church age benefits instead of being age of Israel, right. yeah. but still possessing eternal life. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, in the back of your mouth. Well, Steve, uh, just tie in this verse with your teaching of today. Mm -hmm. Uh, let it be known to you all, Acts 4, all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, Nazareth, and crucified, and thou raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you, whole, stone that the builders rejected, verse, then verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which must be saved. Is name reputation an issue, or is it actual Jesus? Well, I think at this time, since they know the name, that name is is part of what the message is. Yeah, I don't think it. I think again, if we look at the Old Testament, I don't think they understood that they didn't know the name Jesus Christ. They knew the one who would give life, and he would be the one that God would provide. And we know again more and more and more about it. But it doesn't now he's saying that that the people of Israel had rejected this now this one who had displayed himself as the one as the Messiah as the one who came to deliver them, and they had rejected that. Yeah, that's how I would take that. So. Good question. Yes, back here. Uh, isn't that sort of a theological red herring? To, you know, if somebody is asking about, well, how, how is the first century believer that was Old Testament and now New Testament? Isn't, it's a sort of a theological red herring. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that the, the, the reason it comes up is because as good dispensationalists, we have to make a clear demarcation and, and change in that. And, and if you really look at dispensationalism historically, one of the great mistakes dispensationalism made is by showing the different ways in which God deals with people, there was an assumption, because it wasn't clear, that God was dealing with them about salvation in these different ways, and it wasn't. And it really wasn't until probably Ryrie and or Pentecost that added what we would call a soteriological line that said everyone has always been by grace through faith all the way through. But there was, because we had chopped up seven or twelve or, you know, I don't know how many people want to have, that there were somehow different ways in which people were saved. And it, and so we were so, it was so vague that others drove a truck through it. And we were left with, well, uh, 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 so I guess I don't want to be a dispensationalist any longer. And that's really what happened. You're right. It, it doesn't, if we're really consistent, now good, some dispensationalists do think that probably. But that's really not the way I would understand dispensationalism. And I'm looking for a better term anyway. I, I'm looking through it. I, I think dispensationalists fall into some kind of 
disrepair and the way people look at it, it's like, oh, you're a dispensationalist. Yeah, I've had my shots. Yes, Brad. Do you think that the lack of Old Testament understanding about how people gain eternal life impacts, I'll say, a lot of the confusion in Christendom today about the message of life? For example, you need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most Catholics believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's true. One of the interesting things is how many people, how many people of Israel were, were, were justified in a sense that came out of Egypt? You know, during the, during the, the you know, the Red Sea crossing. Oh, they walked. How many? It seemed to indicate by the way the text says that they, 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 they're the ones that had believed. And it wasn't their obedience that made it happen. It was that they believed. There, well, the interesting thing, almost all the way through the Old Testament, it's assumed the, the people they're talking about are saved people. When, here's a here's newsflash. 26 of the 27 books of the New Testament are written with the assumption that the readers are all believers. They don't go, by the way, you have to check your badge. Make sure you put it in the slot. You're a believer. Now, here's how you check it. Every letter assumes you're a child of God, you're a saint in Christ, you're all these things. It doesn't give you all the other things. I think most of the Old Testament is assuming the same thing. God has revealed his message, uh, except for, you know, let's say Obadiah and some of these others are giving prophecy against other nations. But he makes it fairly clear there. I think one of the problems that happens, let's say, with repentance, is they look at Nineveh under Jonah. And the people of, and the king and everybody repented and God did not bring judgment. Does that mean that everyone received everlasting life? It means that the judgment that was coming was postponed. Did they eventually get it? Yes. Nineveh eventually got it. I don't mean got it like got it, but got it. So that's what God does. But we have this assumption that Certainly God's going to explain it to all these people over and over and over when He's already given them from the very beginning. It's always been by grace through faith. And so He tells us a glimpse of it and says, by the way, because it's almost a, you know, a, 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 the vav there in, in, in that way, and Abraham believed God and it was what? Right in His righteousness. Sort of a glimpse of, well, that's how it happened. Now, Here's the problem. Because it happened to Abraham, it didn't say, it also happened to Joe and Pete and Sally and Susie. And da, 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 da. It doesn't say that. Um, here's how I, how I get in trouble. Not other oh, guys, I get in trouble. Dear, your hair looks nice. She goes, well, nice. So my shoes look ugly? Well, no. Well, what about my dress? Uh, uh, I'm stuck. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I start out that way anyway. Start out behind. But the idea is because he mentions one person, he's not saying the only person. I didn't say to my wife, dear, the only thing about you that looks anything good at all is your hair. She really wouldn't like that because uh, it, it's no longer dark hair. <laughs> so, but, but you see, we, have, we, we inject our own thinking and what the Bible says, say what we want it to say, instead of just allowing the Word of God to do that. Yes? Uh, yeah, another question um, dealing with Acts 19 and believers, Old Testament believers, um, and John the Baptist. We know from Acts 19 and other places that, I mean, obviously that John the Baptist's ministry was pointing to Christ. It indicates that the vast majority of Israel went out to John the Baptist. They, at least the repentance part of his message seems to have been widely received. And yet John records that he came to his own, that Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. So I'm curious. I don't hope this makes sense. My question makes sense. You would almost get the, you would almost get the impression, hey, well, okay, in the Old Testament sense of being believers, hey, Israel were all most of the people were because they accepted John the Baptist's message. But then you have, but most of them rejected Jesus. Um, were they only accepting a part of John the Baptist's message? No, no, I, I didn't. I'm not. I'm speaking of of the of the people of Israel. In, it recorded in the Old Testament. I'm not talking about what happened to them in the intertestamental period of 400 years and so on and so forth. I'm just saying the, the, the writings to them specifically are making that assumption. My other, other question as far as 
if, if the, the, the vast majority of Israel accepted John the Baptist's message, did that not include his message of pointing to the Christ? Because we also, it, it seems that the vast majority of Israel did not accept Christ. Does that even make sense? I'm not quite there yet. No, I'm sorry. The- I'm driving there, but I'm not quite made it yet. I'm sorry? Uh, you know, he's preaching to, to, also there are lots of Romans and Gentiles that he was preaching to. But he's talking, I thought, to, specifically to the Jewish people that did not, you know, they put him on the cross. He put him on the cross. Right. Okay. Now, you, yeah, remember this, and, and I would also point to some work that Dr. Niamal has done along with one of our, one of our students, uh, Josiah Bisbee, in that John's usage of Eudaioi is Judean, primarily in Judean leadership, not necessarily all Jews. And there's, an, there's a false assumption that sometimes the target audience is not maybe what is specifically there. John, you had something you wanted to add. I would... Uh, know that uh, John often makes strong statements which then he softens. And one of the places where he makes a strong statement that he softens is in John 12, 37 as a summary of the overall response to Jesus' ministry. Well, uh, particularly among the leadership. But although he had done so many times before them, they did not believe in him. That uh, sounds like an absolute strong statement, no backing out. But then in verse 42, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, so even among the Sanhedrin, many believed in him. Uh, a minority within the Sanhedrin were the Pharisees. The majority were the Sadducees. So you would have at least 36, more than 36, that yeah. would have been Sadducees, and I would not assume that there were any of them that believed in Christ. Yeah. So for him to say many has to be a substantial minority, but it has to be less than 36. But what he says is, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but in making that statement, he is saying, there was resistance among the leadership, and yet we have a substantial minority even within the leadership. And it is not until John chapter 12 even that there was a majority vote for Jesus to be put to death. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I would say that it's saying that there, by implication, was a substantial minority of Israel that believed in Christ. But the John 1.12 statement, the John 1.11 statement, is one of John's strong statements that was not followed by, and he said, fire come down from heaven, but instead he continued to offer the message of life, despite there being a large number of unbelievers. Good. I appreciate that. Um, uh you know, we'll be up here a little bit afterwards and we'll be around for the banquet and so on. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity uh, that we'll be able to look at the simple, clear way in which you present the message that is about you, that children, even a child can understand it, and most of all, that is consistent by grace through faith. And that's always been based upon the finished work, the death and resurrection of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.